thrilled to be here with you today to talk about the research journey. We're going to talk about unpacking the research journey. Uh, as was mentioned, OBI is an active partner in funding, fielding, and disseminating research and really accelerating innovation with the goal of bettering patient outcomes. But today we're gonna to focus on what goes into that, what goes into finding new scientific knowledge, making new discoveries that will help us not only understand our brains better in health, but also in disease, so we can ultimately find better treatment options and just know more about this beautiful brain that's in our, in our heads. Now, an alternative title for this talk could be, why does science take so long? Because I know that's a question we all have. Believe me, I definitely had it through my six year plus PhD. The simple answer to this question is that inside of our skulls, beneath our skulls, in this beautiful brain of ours, there are uh, many beautiful structures made from 171 billion cells connecting with one another in complex and intricate ways and always forming and changing uh, the way that they work and the connections that they have. That complexity in the brain that underlies everything we think and do and remember and are, because of that complexity that we all have, I mean, that's the simple answer as to why things can take a long time. This is not a simple structure by no means. It's hard to get through. It's in the skull. Um, but its complexity is what makes us who we are. And it's what makes it a fascinating area of research and discovery. Now, the long answer here, <laughs> what we're going to get into today, um, is that the brain is complicated and so is science. So is how we study it. So I wanna start with a simple question. What, what is science? And I'd love for folks to type in the chat or, or think amongst themselves, uh, really reflect, what is science? What is it to you? What do you think it is? I'll give you a minute just to, just to ponder, make some, make some hypotheses, which is a little hint there. Science is ultimately a process of discovery. It is the way that we go. Yes, it's a subject in school, but at its core, science is a process of discovery. It helps us to link things that we can find are true about the world and put it together, right? It's yes, we're trying to find facts and truths, but we're also trying to put it together so we can ultimately have a more comprehensive understanding of the natural world. That's a key thing. Science deals in the natural world, things that exist. Um, and that are out there today. It doesn't get into the supernatural. Uh, it stays grounded in, in what we can feel and see, even if it takes a powerful microscope in, in order to do that. Another important tenet of science, it is only testable ideas that are within its purview. If we're trying to study something through the process of science, trying to use this process of discovery of science to learn about something new, we must focus our questions on things that are testable. That's very, very key. It could be hard to test. We might need some new technology in order to do that test. It might take a lot of steps. Of course, I know that. Uh, it took just to answer the smallest of questions, find the smallest of puzzle piece. You had to do years of experiments in the lab. It, it, it can be difficult, but it must be testable some way, somehow. That is the other key. Um, and often we have to break down our questions in science small enough into those testable bites. Now, traditionally, we think of science as this kind of linear process. And I want to still go through that linear process because I think it's helpful um, to think like as a starting point. So first, you make some observations about the world. You ask some questions. Uh, then you're going to develop a hypothesis, right? And you're developing a hypothesis. And typically, this is something, uh, if this were true, you know, you have some kind of, if what I think, if, if I'm observing something, I'm trying to find an explanation. And if this explanation is true, I would expect this certain outcome. That's my hypothesis. And now I'm going to test it to see if that ends up being true. So the next step is to test. So you have some hypothesis, you test it, and you see, is this true? Yes or no. You reject that hypothesis or you accept it and you keep going forward. So really science is iterative slowly over time, ruling things out. Is this true? Yes or no? No. Let's put it to the side and let's find another explanation. Is it this other possible explanation? Is it this other thing? We're slowly, slowly whittling away towards the truth by ruling out explanations that aren't substantiated by evidence from our experimental tests. Okay, so we observe, we ask a question, develop a hypothesis, we test it to see if that hypothesis holds with the outcomes of our test, with our experimental data, and then we make some conclusion based on that and we repeat. So this is kind of the way that you might be taught in high school that science works. It, it feels kind of linear. In reality, while this process 
is true. It's part of a larger ecosystem. Science is a lot more complicated. It's not linear simply in this way. Uh, in fact, I think this structure is a little bit more representative. And of course, this is also an oversimplification, but this is a little more representative. It's iterative. You see, it's not linear. There's a cloud. There's all these feet forward. It's going back and forth. You have an exploration and discovery period. You're experimenting as we just discussed, but there's also peer analysis and feedback with the broader scientific community, with patient groups, people like you. Um, and then that's also all feeding into our societal advancement, uh, policies that we're making, lots of things. And there's arrows in every direction. This is going back and forth. It's an iterative process. That is key. I cannot emphasize that enough. It's an iterative process um, with many different groups involved and happening at many different layers. So I want to spend time today delving into this. This is the core of what we're going to talk about. I want to talk about this big web of connections that is science, this big process that goes back and forth. So let's dive in, starting at the top of this bubble um, with the exploration and discovery. I have some pictures just to show you what this looks like. Uh, I had a lot of fun looking through these old pictures during, of my time during my PhD. This could look like scientists going to conferences, which I know many of us have missed the last few years, uh, talking to our peers, sharing a new data. This is stuff that's kind of, we haven't even published it yet. It's stuff we've just collected in the lab and we want some early feedback from our peers. We go to conferences, we see what other people are learning. And that's really a key way that we all stay in touch and know what the latest, the latest facts are. Um, so this, Co attending conferences, um, going to small meetings and, and hearing about our, our peers' work is a key part of exploration and discovery because we want to know well, what are other people finding? No one scientist can discover everything on their own. Um, even though sometimes the way our prizes are laid out, it seems our scientific prizes, it seems like it's one person's discovery. It's really a community process. And so this pr going to, to reading papers and um, going to conferences and learning about other people's data is a key part of the exploration and discovery process. And in my lab, we did chalk talks, which I loved. Um, it is something that people are, are moving away from. You know, chalkboard is seen as old school, but we loved it in our lab and we were able to present our new findings and draw them out and have new hypotheses. Important part of the chalkboard you can erase and that's an important part of science. You have a new idea, you got to change it when you get new data and go back and fix it. So anyways, we found the chalkboard to be a really helpful way to discuss science. That's This is a bit, I mean, there's, there's a lot more that goes into this, but this type of um, keeping in touch with your peers, learning about what other people are doing, sharing your early findings, um, going back and reading old papers and, and old discoveries and trying to really step back and understand what is known about this field so far. And what isn't known? And what are other people thinking? And what new technology can help me? You spend a lot of time as a scientist exploring and discovering. And clinicians as well are going to be talking to their patients and saying, hey, you know, two people now have come and told me this and I've never read anything about it. So you go to your doctor and you tell them something's happening and, and you're experiencing it. And they're going to talk to their colleagues and, at lunch and say, hey, you know, I had two people say this. Have you heard of that too with your patients? Well, now let's try to think about this in a bigger way. And so then we go to our next step. So there's, there's a lot of this stopping and thinking, um, which is such a privilege and awesome part of, of science and the research process that you get to just think about things. But then of course, it's not all just about sitting there thinking and positing and making hypotheses. You gotta test them, right? We said science must be testable. So that's where experimentation comes in. Now, again, I'm uh, taking you down memory lane. This is what it looked like for me with the type of research I did. I studied cells in a dish. So I spent a lot of time at the microscope analyzing tons of micro microscopy images. I have a whole hard drive of, of uh, pictures of cells um, using different software to analyze them. It looked like, uh, I know it's a cliche to show colorful liquid in a lab, but we actually, this was the color of the, of the cell food that we put the cells in. Uh, it has a pink color to it. Um, and then of course, the classic chemical bench. This is actually what science looked like for me what the experimentation process looked like for me during my PhD. Um, but it was every day going and testing. Um, I've, I don't even know how many thousands of these cell culture plates in the middle there with the pink liquid that I've gone through. Um, but that process of experimentation, repeating um, analysis is really, really core. This is where we're doing that testing of ideas and, and really the testable nature of science comes into play there. Now, of course, that's all great. That's all fun. And then comes the important part, which is critical to the scientific process, that peer analysis and feedback. 
we critique one another's work. You develop a very thick skin. It's the key part of science. Your job as a scientist is in part to poke holes in other scientists' work. Your job as a clinician is to listen to what your colleagues are saying that they're doing with their patients and to think, is there something they might have missed here? It's my job to hold my peers accountable and think, is there something they could be missing? Let me, let me make sure they've considered everything. You know, there's this kind of group, um, that peer review process is so key. And it can happen formally when a scientist has decided they've completed their study and they want to write it up and put it in a journal and publish it. And then it gets in the news and all that. Um, that's one way that it can happen, but it can also happen through these conversations. But there is a formal peer review process that's really important. Um, there's a lot of changes to how this peer review process happens. Right now, there's a big push for open science and OBI, I think, does a great job as a leader in that, making sure that there's open access to data sources and resources. Um, and that's really important because it helps us to do this peer analysis and feedback more efficiently, right? Having these um, consolidated large sources of data so multiple scientists can analyze the same data from the same people and really make sure that they're all making sense of it and using it and using um, each person's contributions to the maximum to help us find more discoveries. It's really, really key. Um, so there are lots of changes to how this peer review process can work thanks to this open science movement and thanks to advanced data sharing methods that we have now, which is really wonderful. Um, but when I say that we must be critical of one another in the sciences, that doesn't mean that you know everyone, every idea equally must be considered. That's called false balance. Um, we have to weigh the, the total, totality of evidence and make sure that our colleagues aren't missing that. And so we should just be careful there. That doesn't mean that like every criticism is equally valid. There is a totality of evidence we must look at, um, but it is very important to get that feedback as well. Okay, so this traditionally is happening through the publication of, of research papers. And now we're gonna spend some time looking at that different types of research papers and studies that are out there. And I've organized it into, this is, uh, I didn't come up with this hierarchy myself. Um, this hierarchy kind of exists of the, the quality of the evidence um, for different types of studies. And I'm gonna take you through each of them one by one. But what I wanna say here is that ultimately the key takeaway, you don't have to memorize every part of this hierarchy. What I want you to know is that there are different types of studies. And then there are studies of studies, which is what we'll start with. Um, and depending on the type of study, we're going to put more or less emphasis on this. This is important from a patient perspective because you may see something in the news and take it back to your doctor and they say, oh, that's nice, but, you know, I'm not going to change your course of care because of that. And this going through this hierarchy will help you understand why. So first, let's look at. So as we go through this hierarchy at the very top is going to be the highest quality of evidence. And then um, all of it is important. The, the papers that come beneath, they are the foundation for that high quality evidence. They're very important. I'm not saying that they're not, but it's, it's like, it's not a paradigm shift per se just yet. So let's just start at the top and then all of this will make more sense. First, we have meta-analyses and systematic reviews. If something is in a meta-analysis or a systematic review, a good one that's in a peer reviewed paper and it's written by experts in the field, that means that um, it's, we're going to take that seriously. Whatever the finding of that is, is like, okay, we need a, we might need to change things around here. So a meta-analysis, meta and then analysis, it's an analysis of many other papers. Um, and I'll just show you with an example, one right from OBI. Um, here they're looking at the role of physical activity in the prevention and management of Alzheimer's disease, specifically with an Ontario lens written by a bunch of experts. And what you can see just from their methods, uh, summary of their methods, um, they looked at 871 research articles. And then they looked, including 24 randomized controlled trials and 21 cohort studies. We're going to talk about that in a second. That's why this is at the top of the hierarchy, though. They've now an analyzed hundreds of papers, and maybe not all of them were included in the final analysis. But this is the bird's eye view of like, OK, lots of people have been studying this. Let's put it together and let's do this meta study on these studies. And so that's why this is at the top, because it's like many iterations of work, many layers of peer review, and now we're combining it all together. Okay, so that's at the top and reviews when you're reviewing all of the data that exists. Again, when it's um, written by experts, a systematic review and a meta-analysis hold a lot of weight. Next comes randomized controlled trials. 
These are trials. Um, I'm just going to show you. These are for clinical trials. These are things you may be familiar with. Um, a really popular example is the, the recent vaccine trials. These were randomized control trials. They are very high quality evidence, and I'll show you why. This is the process of a trial. You take a representative sample population. You're going to randomly assign people um, to either the test group or the control group at the bottom here. The people in the test group, they're still going to get the current standard of care. We, it's unethical for us to deny care to people if we know that a cancer patient, for example, or a brain tumor patient should be receiving some level of care. We're not going to withhold that from them just because they're in a trial. That wouldn't be ethical. Um, we'll give them the current standard plus a potential new treatment that we want to explore through the trial. And then in the bottom are people who will be the control group, meaning that they're not getting any new treatment. They're getting the standard. And that's really important because after some, you'll have some predetermined outcome you're looking for. Let's say we want to see if this new drug reduces the tumor growth size um, over six months. That's the size of the tumor's growth <laughs> over six months. And so then you can measure it at a pre, you predetermine in advance because you don't want to be biased during the study as you're getting results in. You'll predetermine at six months. That's our end point. And we're going to look and see the size of the tumors between both of these groups and see if there's a difference. And if there is a clinical difference and a statistically significant difference, um, then we're going to pursue this further. And then other people will check in other groups of patients and different parts of the world. And that's definitely what happened with the vaccines, um, which is why people are so confident in them now, because we've now had many different sites repeat these types of trials and look in all sorts of directions and it's holding up to what the original trial found. Same thing with any other new um, brain treatment as well. So those randomized controlled trials have a lot of weight because they're basically you know, a, a really great way to show, of course, there are always limitations in what you can find, but it's kind of uh, one of the ideal scenarios for testing a new thing. You can't always do one. So just because a certain drug doesn't have a randomized control trial doesn't mean it's not good. Sometimes there are limitations as to into what you can actually study in people. Um, but, but that's why this one holds a lot of weight. Next in our hierarchy are case control studies. Again, you don't need to memorize all of this. I just want you to get a feel for what the different types of, of research uh, looks like. And I'll show you how you can use this to navigate the news better. Um, so don't worry if this is a lot of terms, that's okay. As long as you get a sense from this that there are is a hierarchy of sorts. Um, so case control studies are gonna look back in time. So they're gonna start with people who have a condition and people who don't, so over on the right side of the screen. And then you're gonna look back and see and do patient histories and talk to them. And this is where you all come in um, and, and, and your networks and communities come in uh, and you try to, the researchers will try to piece together, okay, this person was exposed to this when they were young and this person wasn't, and this person has the disease and they don't. And let's see, now you, you can't just use one person, you need to look at many people, does this hold up? Because people are messy. We're not mice in a lab. We don't have everything perfectly controlled in our environment. There's tons of variation between me and you and the person uh, next to you and the, and the person in the house next door. Um, so you really have to be careful. Um, and that's why scientists do this in a systematic way. Clinicians do this in a systematic way. Looking, are there, is there any hints we can get from hearing their life story? And then you could identify some key risk factors there and see, okay, maybe it was exposure to this as a kid. Okay, so those are your case control studies. Really, really good. You're looking back in time, so you can't really, you're not testing new interventions here. You're seeing what already had happened, but that can be really informative. Next, we have cohort studies and cross-sectional studies. They're different, but I'm just lumping them together here because they're kind of on similar playing field. But essentially in a cohort study, for example, you're looking at groups with some common characteristic, some, some, something in common, maybe it's demographics or maybe it's geographical location or something. And then you're waiting over time and tracking what happens with them. So you'll often see these large studies based on a geographical area and then just tracking people over time. These are longitudinal studies. They take place over many, many years. And that just helps us. It's kind of nice if someone enrolls in a longitudinal study today, then we can get information over the next 10, 20 years. And then we can really know, okay, what's going on long-term here? What are some long-term risk factors and, and um, patterns we can learn over the long course that can be hard to study in smaller, in smaller shorter studies, right? So those can be really valuable too. Case reports, this is something that a clinician could write up. They've seen a patient and it was unique and interesting. They're not sure 
if it's unique to this patient or a phenomenon that's perhaps rare and hasn't been studied before. Um, so they write it up as a case report so that other people can be alerted. And maybe another clinician reads that and says, hey, I've seen that too in a patient. And you get enough people doing that. And hey, maybe you go do a cohort study or something, right? Um, or maybe you recruit those people to, to doing a, a bigger trial of sorts. So that's kind of what the case report is. It's usually on you know one or two people, a patient write up. And then we have these mechanistic studies. This is the kind of thing I used to do in the lab, studying you know, how do our cells divide? That was what I was interested in. How do cells in the brain form, right? And I'm trying to actually find out the mechanism for how this basic process happens. Just because this is lower in the hierarchy, it doesn't mean it's not important. I wanna reemphasize that. It just means that it's what I found is important and it's gonna need other studies to come together so that we can move up the hierarchy, right? All of these things are foundational. They're incredibly important. We need that fundamental type of discovery, but it's going to need to come together with other things before it makes it to humans, before it, it changes the way we deliver care. And then last, editorials and expert opinions. Important, especially when it's an expert speaking on their area of expertise. That's a key one. Um, but bottom of the, of the hierarchy. That's why when you see, you know, some famous doctor says this, and it's their opinion, it doesn't mean that we should ignore it, but we're not gonna let that detract someone's opinion, even if they're a professional, detract from data we have from a randomized controlled trial. That's why you might sometimes hear someone say, I'm sorry, that's an interesting opinion this person has, but someone coming with a contrary view, if we're gonna go back and, and reiterate the science, your contrary view should be should have similar quality evidence as the thing that you're trying to refute. We often call this the burden of proof, right? If you're trying to say that the data we have for many meta-analyses and randomized um, control studies is not good, you got to show me randomized control studies and meta-analyses to prove it, right? You have to have similar quality evidence before we're going to go rewrite the textbooks. Of course, that can take time and it takes going through the hierarchy, but that's why sometimes we won't always change things just by what one person said or a few people said, because there's so much evidence that's gone into the other point. Okay, so let's see this in the wild. Uh, I went and looked up some recent headlines. I just did a random search on brain related headlines and some other topics. And let's just quickly put this into practice. So this one, uh, a psychology opinion piece, I think it was in Scientific American, uh, a new dimension to a meaningful life. It's a big claim there. Okay, studies suggest that appreciating beauty in the everyday may be just as powerful as a sense of overarching purpose. Fascinating. I looked at the study, uh, sorry, I looked at this write-up of the study. This is a news piece, so it's not the technical paper, it's the write-up of the study. And I tried to find, because I want to show you an example of how you can identify where in the hierarchy different news pieces are. Um, and here they said, they, they reference, you'll always find it in a good scientific um, journalistic piece. If you're reading Globe and Mail, you're reading Trump Star, you're reading New York Times Science, you're reading a Scientific American, these are good quality journals. They should have, they'll always reference where this information is coming from. And usually they'll hyperlink it as well, which they did here. That's a good flag just to watch out for when you're reading news. And here they said there's a series of studies that it comes from. So I, I said series of studies, huh, this, this, could, this could be a meta-analysis. So maybe this is huge and groundbreaking. And then I clicked the hyperlink and it looks like it was a series of studies in one paper, which is still phenomenal, um, many of which in included like cross-sectional type of studies, studies looking at um, data from a population at one specific point in time. So not longitudinal. It's just saying, hey, let's look at these one people. Let's ask them how they feel in their purpose of life and go from there to summarize. <laughs> um, so that's good. Again, this doesn't mean I don't care about the paper. This doesn't mean it wasn't an interesting paper. It's a fascinating paper. It's really, really cool. Is it gonna change everything about how I live my life? Let's look at this hierarchy. It's kind of in the middle there. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna think about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this closely and I'm gonna think and um, I'm gonna think on it and see if it applies. And, but I won't be surprised if other scientists have a contrary opinion or a have data to the contrary, or have other things that they may say, eh, this might not be the whole picture. That's what this means. It doesn't mean it was bad or anything. It means that there might be more to the story that we haven't found out yet. 
very fascinating. Going to keep it in mind because, hey, I'd love to have a more meaningful life, but um, I'll know that there could be something else out there. I'm not going to be frustrated when I see a similar headline in two years because I'm going to realize, oh, cool, we've learned more. That's where this hierarchy is helpful. It lets us know, like, should we be shocked if there's something different coming out? Okay, here's another fun one. It has to do with dogs. It was a this was the New York Times headline. They're all good dogs, and it's been not, has nothing to do with their breed. Um, and here you can see they looked at over 18,000 dogs and sequenced genomes of 2,000. That's phenomenal. What type of study was this? It was a cohort study. Where is that in our hierarchy? Same around the middle. And this is a really large sample size. So for this, I'm going to say, okay, pretty cool. Again, there might be more to this story, but I think this is informative and. Uh, clearly was a really big study. And maybe this will start start us changing and, and going down a new route of hypotheses and a new way and rebuilding our models slowly. We're kind of still in the process now of shifting our models on, on dog behavior. And then this was a really big one. Live fast, die young, or live cold, die old. What a bold headline for something that was done in mice and hamsters. Again, my research was in mice. Very important. But that's lower at the mechanistic side type of study. This is helping us find like fundamental things we can't study in humans yet. Like so crucial that they did this study in mice and hamsters, but a little soon for us to now show a picture of a human in the thumbnail for this study and be sharing it. Like now everyone needs to change their body temperature, right? That's the danger here. This study was important, it's crucial, it's fascinating, it's really hard work that probably took years and years and years of many scientists' time. So it is important, but it just means we aren't ready to translate that patient to patients yet. We gotta wait, we gotta have it done by more people, we gotta have it, um, it's been peer reviewed because it's published, but we need to have more people replicate it and learn more and then we move up to people, then we move up to the next step in, the, in, our, in our framework. So this isn't gonna edit the textbooks just yet. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, that's really what goes into the peer analysis and feedback. And a really key thing I wanna emphasize here because it's, it's where you come in. In my little diagrams where I was showing the different types of studies and what goes into them, I just showed you know blocks of people. Um, and I mentioned very quickly, these need to be representative of your sample population. And this has historically, been a big issue where we haven't had proper representation, sometimes because of ease. Um, you know, a lot of studies are done in college students because they're on campus where research is being done. So researchers recruit the students who are right there. And that's a that's a logistics thing. That makes sense. But ultimately, before we're moving things up that ladder, right, before we're going to translate it to all patients, we need to make sure there's representation. And that's where it's so important that we have everyone um, from different ancestries, different ages, different types of a, of a different disease um, coming forward and participating. And, and as scientists and clinicians, we have to do the work um, to make sure people are coming and participating in science. But the, sci the quality of the evidence, I don't care what type of study it's done, if it wasn't done in a true representative sample population, I'm always gonna, even if it's a randomized controlled trial, if it wasn't done in people of diverse ancestries, I'm now gonna take pause before we say, you know, okay, great for for um, great for everyone in the world when we haven't really tested that. You can't always do that, of course, but it's just a consideration we need to have um, when putting emphasis on the on the use and the findings. So that's a really key thing, and it's and it's where you all come in 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 making sure as patients that you're represented and talking um, and and participating and doing what you can to make sure there's good representation in the research. It's a it's a two-way street and it's a very, very important one. And then next, once we've gone through all of these things and we're moving towards, you know, we've repeated the studies enough, we have a strong foundation for how things work, we've tested it in lots of people, we're kind of ready to move up that hierarchy, we're ready to move it to societal advancement, we're ready to move it out into the world. Um, and this is where, you know, OBI is a, is a really important key player in the central because we can start now saying, okay, we have enough evidence here. We don't want to wait. We don't want to be withholding this treatment. We could probably use a few more studies, but we're ready to move it out into more people um, uh, because if we've proven it's safe, it seems effective um, and like it's ready. <laughs> it's ready to, to reach more people. And that's where the regulators come in. 
and they'll assess and make sure, is this right for a Canadian population? Is this right? Does Canada have a need for this? So the regulators will come in now looking at what's best for the Canadian population, which the researchers may not have been focused on. They were just focused on um, their patient populations. Now the regulators come in and say, what makes sense for the people in this country and for the standard of care we like to provide in this country, which we're really lucky is, is quite high. Um, and then to make sure it can be accessible, can we commercialize this and make sure it can reach enough people? Do we need to develop new tech to make sure this can reach people? Um, and that's where we can start to solve problems, answer questions and satisfy our curiosity and really build knowledge. And it's that translation of the science um, that's really key. But you'll notice that there are arrows everywhere. And so this is all iterative and back and forth. Um, and we're always paying attention. Something, if something's out there being used, um, it's still always being, it's being monitored, it's being studied. And if there are any issues, we'll go back and reassess. There's nothing ever fixed in stone. I think that gives a lot of people a bit of pause and makes them a little nervous, but it's an important part. These arrows are in every direction. There is, it is iterative because there are limitations to science, right? Science isn't always, uh, science isn't about how best to use new research. That's kind of, it could be um, many other people de deciding, including patients. Again, where you come in is how best to use the new findings, making sure that we can equitably distribute it, often through policy, right? Because we don't live in a vacuum, we live in a society, and, and this is where policy comes in. You could screen someone for um, um, a type of dementia every day. You could. And then you would know exactly when they start to have um, symptoms of, of, of dementia. You could do the screening tool every day. But does that work on a population level? Does that make sense? Is that a good use of our resources? That's where policy comes in. That's not in the purview of the science per se. Um, it's a way that science gets used in science-based policies, thinking about what's the best use for this on a population level. Um, and of course, the limitation of science is time. <laughs> it takes time to do. And sometimes it will take time to get that, ne that next discovery. But the key is that it's always going back and forth. It's always being iterative. These arrows are the most important part, um, showing that interconnectedness. And you play a big role in that, in participating in any level. You may not see how enrolling in a fundamental mechanistic study and being a part of that early exploration, discovery, and experimental phase, you may not see the impacts of that right away. But because everything is interconnected, when you participate in science and when you be part of that sample population, it is going to have an impact on all levels. You may not see it immediately. It may not be immediately obvious. It's not going to translate to policy right away, but it will now be in this ecosystem to forever impact the decisions that we make, the care that we give. And that becomes a legacy the legacy of science, the legacy of your participation in science is in the way that it will forever be a part of this knowledge base and forever be feeding into the future of what is known, what is unknown, and how we treat and move together forward as a, a society, as a population, as humans on the earth. Your legacy is to be a part of this at any level. It impacts and resonates and echoes at every other level with time. So with that, I think we're in a good place. I'll put up how you can reach out to me if you ever have any other questions. But really importantly, because I said you are a very important part of science, I want to hear from your questions and hear from you about what else you want to learn about this awesome process of science.